We glorify your name. We glorify your name. We've seen your grace and work in us. We're reminded of your steadfast love. Here we stand. God, we are so thankful. Looking back, we know you've been faithful. We're expecting for the future. God loves you. 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 Just to let you know that God loves you. God loves you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Connect Life Church. We're really excited to have you with us. We've got a great service of head, some amazing worship, and Pastor Steve is going to be preaching upon the book of Acts, the first in our series. But let's open in prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for your goodness and that you love us. I want to thank you that even though we're meeting together in different homes, you are with us and we're still church and we're still family. I pray that this morning, whatever chaos is happening around us, you will help us to focus in on what you wish to say to each and every one of us. Amen. I'm now going to hand over to our worship team who are going to lead us in sung worship.
voices and our hearts to you um, as we sing together no matter where we are. In Jesus' name, Amen.
And so now we've come to this place in our service where Andy is going to lead us in communion. As I was preparing for this communion, two verses of hymns came into my mind. The first one was, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath his flood, lose all their guilty stains. And at the moment, they're still finding a, a cure for COVID, and all over the world for different diseases, scientists and doctors and etc., all seeking cures for illnesses. But there is one thing that is the greatest illness man could know, and that's sin. And there is only one cure. And that verse tells us all about that, how on Calvary, Jesus gave himself and gave up his life and bled and died in our place that we might be free from sin. The other verse says, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions and now I'm free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. And the other verse is going to die in for me, risen for me, living for me, come in for me. There's two things about this. First of all, the me. That's the important bit. At the end of every sentence almost, there's the word me. Because this is a personal experience with God. A personal encounter that belongs between us and Jesus. It's not for anybody else. This is personally for me and personally for you. And he was wounded that we might be set free from our illnesses and diseases. He died that we might live. He gave himself on the cross that we might be the sons and daughters of God. He is living at this moment. It tells us that Jesus is in heaven praying and interceding for you and I. And finally, he's coming again. You see, there are lots of adverts on holidays that, that give you the full package and will tell you there's lots of extras. Well, this is the full package. What Jesus did on Calvary and his resurrection from the death is the full package and gives me and you a freedom from sin, a freedom to be who we should be in God, and a place in heaven. So there is nothing like what Jesus did on Calvary. And we're remembering that today, and remembering that because of what he did, you and I belong to God, a part of the family of God, and are one day going to spend eternity with him. And that's a wonderful thing. So as we take communion together, let us remember those things, that we were washed and set free from our sin, that he was wounded for us, that he died for us, that he rose for us, that he lives for us, and that he's coming back for us. So let's celebrate that in this communion this morning. And he took bread and gave thanks, and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in your blood, which is shed for you. So let's share communion together. Let's first take of the bread and remember his broken body. Let's now take of the wine or the substitute for his blood that was shed for us at Calvary. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Thank you for dying on Calvary. Thank you for paying the price in full that we might have reconciliation with the Father. Thank you, Lord for making us fit for the kingdom of heaven by your righteousness. Lord, help us to follow in your footsteps and to be all that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we have Myra, who's going to be sharing a reflection as we come to the end of our series on Proverbs. As we come to the end of our readings in Proverbs, it's not that you have to be a woman to bring some thoughts about Proverbs 31 and the woman described there. It was in fact written for a male audience, but here we go. I'm part of an online forum which has also been discussing these verses this week, which has come at a great time. 
Like so many of us, I have had a love-hate relationship with the description I read here. This woman is a wife, mother, businesswoman, hard worker, on the go from morning till night, and apparently never has a hair out of place, a speck of dust in her home, a hormone playing up, or a bag under her eyes. She seems so perfect and set a standard of busyness which I found unobtainable, and however hard I tried, I could never measure up to what she did. I read books which suggested more and more ways that I could become this woman, which made me more and more discouraged. In fact, many of those books were projecting the ideal woman as being retiring, servile and entirely domestic. However, this woman is so much more than this. She's a manufacturer, an importer, a manager, a property magnate, a farmer, a seamstress and a merchant. And then I noticed two things. The first, the mention of the servant girls. She may have been a good manager, but she didn't do all the housework herself. She had people to help her, which is just as well because her husband just sits at the city gate all day. And secondly, I realized that she may be an example to follow, someone to inspire us and possibly even a composite of many different people but she is not a person we need to become. We are called to be ourselves and to become more and more like Jesus. In fact, we're not told that her strength and dignity come from any of her many achievements, but from her reverence to God. And in our society where physical appearance counts for so much, we may be surprised to notice that her physical appearance is never mentioned at all. Her attractiveness comes entirely from her character. I love that the whole book of Proverbs begins and ends with the command to fear the Lord. We're told in chapter 1 that to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it ends in chapter 31 with the picture of a person who fulfills that command. A person who is hardworking and diligent and speaks with honesty and kindness, who builds margin into life so that when the winter seasons come, whether physically or emotionally, there's enough stored up to carry them all through, who cares for those less fortunate and is completely trustworthy. These are the results of a life well lived before God, who puts him first and who surrenders to the beautiful transforming work of the Holy Spirit. As Heidi Baker puts it, none of us is too clever or too extraordinary that we don't need God's help. We all need help. I need help. I want to help a dying world, but I can't do it on my own. I need to know God's plans and follow his way. I need to empty myself out so he can fill me. I need to say, here's my life, Lord. Let me wear the turban of your thoughts. Let me be so fully possessed by you that even my mind is captured by you. And as we surrender to him, give him everything. Let it all go and trust him. We will, as we're promised in the book of Ephesians, be able to know the love that surpasses all knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God bless you. Hi guys, welcome back to our craft videos on a Sunday morning. Today I'm really excited to share with you a craft idea from Proverbs chapter 27. Now this um, particular verse from chapter 27 talks about how the sweetness of a friend is better than self-counsel. Now that means that having a friend and having a friend help you in life is much better than doing it by ourselves. And that's true with our good friends, but it's also true with Jesus. And it's important to remember that Jesus is our very, very special, very important, very powerful friend. And today we're going to do a craft around the fact that we need to remember just how special and important of a friend Jesus is. And the sweetness of Jesus' friendship is better than doing it just by ourselves. 
Now, because the verse talks about sweetness, I thought we could do something that smells quite sweet and smells quite nice. So what I've done is I've drawn a cube net on some card and I've folded all the little bits of paper up. And once you've done that, you might want to get your parents to help you if you like. But once you do that, you can glue it together so that you've got a cube with a little lid as well. So before you glue down your lid, you might want to go into your garden, get some daisies, get some grass, get some nice sweet smelling plants. I've got some nice sweet smelling petals here and you can put them in your cube. And if you want it to smell extra sweet, you might get some perfume and just put a bit of perfume on the petals and on the flowers today. And then, you will have a beautifully sweet smelling cube and you can always draw on your cube and decorate it as well and write the verse down to remind us that Jesus is such a sweet and a special friend to us and doing life with Jesus is much better than doing life alone. So I hope the craft is really enjoyable for you today and that you remember how amazing Jesus is and have a really lovely Sunday. We now get to hear another My Story. As you know, over the last couple of months, we've been able to hear some stories from you in our congregation and also some stories from family that are in other churches. And today, we get to hear Neil's story. My name is Neil and this is my story. I've lived in Cardiff all my life. Uh, I was a top cyclist, a road cyclist, and I worked in a large engineering company a few miles outside of Cardiff. Uh, I was, as I say, I was a top cyclist. Um, I used to do a lot of road, track, and time trials on the bike. Um, and I was career developed moves into a different department that caused me to work what's called continental shifts. So overnight my racing stopped, um, and the department I worked in was very aggressive and bullying. And what I discovered was because of my lack of outlet of sport, I started to get panic attacks, which I didn't understand, and started sliding into deep depression. Um, work allowed me to take a year off on the sick, and during that time on the sick, um, I went off uh, backpacking around Thailand a few times. Um, a friend of mine had recommended Thailand as a good place uh, for sun. Um, and a different way of life and I sort of met uh, Buddhism at the time and got involved in Buddhism um, and started following the Dalai Lama uh, but also while I was off on depression on long-term sick leave um, I came across a program about the Alpha course and it was hosted by David Frost and a lot of the people on the course were saying how their lives were being transformed by going on the Alpha course and I was off sick thinking well, I need my life to be transformed, so I need to find out more about it. So I went on the internet and found that my local church that I now attend was running an Alpha course. Um, I surprised them all by walking in because no one had invited me, no one knew me. Um, and this is a course that helps people understand and discover Christianity, something I'd never really thought about or known about growing up. It was just out there. Um, and I, during that course, you know, you, you're taught about God and Jesus and the Christian faith, what it means. And as it says in a, you become transformed by reading the truth of the gospel. Um, during that course on the Holy Spirit Away Day, I gave my life to Jesus. And since then, my life has been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and my wife has since come to faith and our daughter has her own personal walk with Jesus and she's been baptized recently. Um, and I just, I'd love people to know more about Jesus and be transformed by his, his love and his Holy Spirit. The difference that coming to know Jesus and giving my faith to him, it truly is transforming. I've, I have no depression, I have no fears anymore, and I don't worry about what life throws at me. Uh, death doesn't scare me at all, I'm not worried of death. Um, yeah, and I just love reading more about him and I'd almost like to be one of his disciples walking alongside him for three years, getting to know him more.
And now we're going to sing another worship song together. Hello, we now have a few announcements for you. Like normal, on Tuesday at 7.30, we have our prayer meeting together. It only lasts half an hour, so it'd be really great if you could come and join us for that. As I mentioned at the start of the service, exciting times, we're going into the book of Acts now. So for the next four weeks or so, we're going to be looking at a different chapter of Acts a day, starting from Acts 1, and this week, Steve is going to be preaching from Acts 3 for us. I also want to say a huge thank you for everyone who's continued to give to our church. You don't realise how much this blesses us because it enables us to continue with the work that we need to do at this time, particularly in relation to COVID and all the building work that's going on. So thank you so much. Also have some really happy and exciting news to give you. Simon and Anna, they're getting married on the 5th of September. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it can't happen in this church. It's going to be a very small ceremony with just close family, and they're going to get married in Bath. We also have two engagements over our summer of love. Cameron and Grace have finally got engaged, so we all wish the best to both of them, and good luck to Grace. And also, James and Katie have got engaged, and so we're really happy to hear that. Now, we've also got important news about the church's opening, and I'm going to hand over to Steve to give that to you. Hi, I'm looking a bit more casual because I've been getting myself ready for when we reopen church on Sunday the 6th of September. Now, if you've not already had our email, I want to let you know that basically our numbers are going to be limited and church is going to look very different to normal. First of all, if you book to be a part of that service or we've already booked you to be a part of that service, then you will enter through our old entrance, which is now becoming our new entrance. And don't forget, 
you need your face mask and you need to use our hand sanitizer and you need to make sure that you observe social distancing. And then you will come down the corridor, which is going to look a lot more smart before you arrive because we have new carpet that we've ordered to be there. And you'll come into the church and there will be a seat that is specifically designated for your name. The stewards will help you all the way, making sure that you can find your seat safely and easily. As you know, we're starting with our services, basically showing the live stream service on our big screens. And that's so that those of you who are not able to watch this video, so it's the people I'm talking to that aren't able to be with us today, will have first priority in being able to come into the church and watch the service with others. But that's probably around about 10, 12 people maximum. So we have got some other seats that we would like to fill. And one of those seats could have your name on it. You can sit if you are a single by yourself, or you can sit in family groups, or you can sit by yourself if you don't want to sit next to your husband. But we hope that you will want to sit next to your husband or your wife or with your family, because the more people that come that way, the more people that we can fit into our church services. If you need to use the toilets during the church services, they will also be available to you. We just ask that you make sure that you use the hand sanitizers and wash your hands after you have used the toilet facilities. And we keep the number of people in the main toilets to a maximum of two people at any one time. And then when you leave the service, we will let you leave one group at a time. We hope that this information will help you. This is just the start of us beginning to come together again. And we hope that a number of you will be able to join us on our first week and many others will be joining us online. As we start planning and looking towards a phased reopening of our church, I just want to say how excited I am that I'm going to get to be a part of this and that I'm going to be working for you lovely people. I can't wait to see what the future is going to hold for us. And remember, whatever difficulties and troubles we have, God has already made a way. There's no obstacle that he can't overcome. And we're standing in confidence that the future is going to be bright. And even though this phase reopening may be slower than some of us want, it's all in God's timing and he's got it. I'm now going to hand over to Steve, who's going to preach from the book of Acts for us. And we're all going to start reading this together from the beginning of September. Well, good morning. And today we are going to prepare ourselves as later this week, we begin to read through together through the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts was written, as many of you will know, by Luke, and it follows on from his gospel that we looked at a few months back. And it's packed with adventure as the church begins to share the good news of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to actually start today by reading from Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gates called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, 
all the people were astonished and came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or good godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. So today, I want us to take a look at this passage and I've chosen not to go from the first couple of chapters of Acts, which are probably the most famous of all, but we'll be looking at those through our daily readings together as Kirsty shares with us uh, beginning next week. But, you know, as we look at this story, I have to admit, I really love this story. I wonder what your experience is when you yourself are trying to tell people about Jesus. Who in this room, or watching at home, should I say, finds it easy to tell people about Jesus? It's difficult, isn't it? Most of us find it hard. Some of us, perhaps, don't have the courage to strike up a conversation about Jesus with somebody else. But as we look at this story, I wonder how you would feel if you were the people in this story. I'm so encouraged that Jesus, only a few months after his death, used Peter and John, who had messed up big time, but they, he used Peter to do this amazing miracle. You see, we often look at Peter and John as spiritual superstars or giants, and that kind of can come across. But the truth is, they were just ordinary people, probably feeling a bit out of their depth in this city of Jerusalem, which was religiously sophisticated, and they were from the north of the country. But I think one thing that is important for us to realise is that the primary way that people came to know Jesus 2,000 years ago and do today is through building relationship with people. Most people don't have a dramatic revelation of Jesus or a dream or a vision. It happens to some, but most people, it's through an encounter with another Christian. In this story that follows, there's a miracle and again, some of us might look at that and think, oh, we can't do those things. But we need to remember that the same power that was in Peter and John is the same Holy Spirit that is available to us as Christians. So let's have a little look at this story in a bit more detail. I remember one time someone came into my office with a request. Can I use your phone? And the reason why they wanted to use my phone was because they had no credit. Have you ever felt in life like you have no credit? Well, I would think if you were looking at this guy who was sitting at the beautiful gate, he was someone who had no credit. He was dependent on others for almost everything that he did. He couldn't even get to the place where he wanted to beg without the help of other people. It says in verse 1 that as Peter and John were going to the temple to pray, there was a man crippled from birth who was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg by those from those going into the temple courts. Can you imagine that? Every day he's carried to the same place. He is totally dependent upon other people. We see Peter and John here are going to the temple to pray. Just a little aside here before we go into the story. But they obviously recognised how important it was to pray to God. To ask God to help them in every situation that they were facing. Before we talk to our friends about God, it's a good idea to talk to God about our friends. So let's take a look at this lame man. As we've already mentioned. He was someone who was powerless. He was powerless to change his own situation. The Bible tells us that he relied on friends to get him to that gate, that beautiful gate, every day. It would seem that he had always been this way. He lived in close proximity, probably, to the temple. He lived close to this beautiful gate. And we live in a society that has never had so much 
and yet has never been so much in need. We live in a society that so often finds itself feeling powerless. You know, the tragedy is that many are within walking distance of this church or another church, and yet they've never realised that there's an answer there, that Jesus is the answer. It might be a place that they just visit for births or marriages or deaths, or for hatches, matches and dispatches, as it's sometimes called. But the other thing about this guy is he was placed every day at a beautiful gate. Can I suggest to you that despite the beauty of his surroundings, the lame man probably couldn't see it. He lived in a society where he was surrounded by beauty, in his case a beautiful gate, and yet there wasn't much beauty in his life. He was broken. He was hurting. We live in a beautiful world. I've just experienced that going away on holiday to Scotland and all the beauty around us. And yet the tragedy is so many of us are broken and hurting. And despite all that this man lacked, this day something was going to happen in his life. He had sat at this beautiful gate for years probably. He was a beggar. He relied on handouts from other people. And again, he looked at others to meet his needs. And today there are many who need to look to others to meet their needs emotionally, physically. There are needs of all different kinds. He needed to reach out to others, yet not ever really reaching out to the one who could really meet his need. You know, as Christians, we have within us the ability something special that can meet the needs of others. And yet so often people are looking in the wrong places for answers. Someone said that sharing our faith with others could be described as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, we need to be people who share the good news, the bread of life with others. And even when this lame man saw Peter and John, he didn't ask for healing. He asked for money. You know, it's amazing how many people, when you suggest what is the real problem in our society, how many of them would often say, well, what we need is a little bit more money. It often comes top or at least near the top of our list. And even as Christians, we can think that that is the answer. We're in a society at the moment that is looking for an answer to a big problem, COVID-19. But the reality is, compared to the real problems of people's hearts and lives, COVID is a small part of that. We live in a society that is obsessed by looking for answers. And yet, so sadly, often the people end up looking in the wrong places for those answers that will never really meet their real needs. You know, the lame man was looking for money. But praise God for Peter, who saw beyond the request to the real need. And he had the faith to believe God for a real answer. I'm sure he remembered how Jesus had done this. When a paralyzed man is lowered before him, and he sees the man who's paralyzed, and yet the first thing he says to him is, your sins are forgiven you. You see, for many of us, our big problem as Christians is that we don't have enough people, as it were, on our contact list. Go back to mobile phones. You know, it's great when you've got a mobile phone, but you need some contacts on that list to be able to ring them up. And Peter was someone who was willing to make contact with this lame man. What does he say to him? He says, look at us. And so the man, it says in verse 5, gave him his attention. He looked straight at him. Peter showed an interest in this man. This was not just a project for Peter. It wasn't someone to try out his power of the Holy Spirit on. But Peter made contact with this person. And if we're going to be effective in reaching our friends and our neighbours and our strangers, even in this time where we're social distancing and all the challenges that we face, we're going to need to make contact with people. You know, in some ways it's never been easier to make contact with people 
But yet, in many ways, it's never been harder. But the other thing is that Peter makes the connection. He makes the connection. You see, it's no good making a call if you can't make the connection with the call. If you've got no signal. But Peter makes the connection with this guy. He says, look at us. I wonder who are your friends looking at today? And if they were to look at you, would they see something of Jesus this week? That's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? We need God's Holy Spirit to guide us and to lead us. He didn't at this point, by the way, say, look at Jesus. He was going to point him to Jesus, but before that, he made contact with the person. And, you know, we need to make contact with people around us. Many of you will know, if you're football fans, that very rarely is a goal scored direct from the kickoff. You need to build up the play to get the goal. And the same is true in our lives. We need to be making contact with people and encouraging them to look at our lives and reflect Jesus through our lives. Following on from this chapter in chapter 4, you're going to read and see that John and Peter faced imprisonment because of what had happened this day. But when the authorities saw them, what they recognised in them was the risen, resurrected Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verse 14, or verse 13, it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What did they see? Well, they didn't see their great education because they didn't have it. They probably recognised that their accents were from the north of the country. But what they did see was they saw Jesus. They saw the courage that they had to stand. And they could see Jesus and God's Holy Spirit working in them. What do people see when they look at us, when they look at me, when they look at you? I hope that they can see more of Jesus in our lives. And then the next point, going on to our phone calls again, is who are you going to call? And it's not Ghostbusters. You see, the reality was that at this point, Peter needed to draw upon something that was beyond himself. It says, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I love the honesty of Peter. He was clear about what he didn't have. He told him that he didn't have any money. And I think it's vital for us as Christians that we don't try and con people into believing in God. You know, people hate it when they're conned. Even more so when it comes from church. We need to be honest with people in the way that we speak to them. But sometimes I think we just need to be honest enough to admit that we haven't got some of the things that they're asking for. But we have got what they really need. Peter was honest. He admitted that he didn't have the money that the man wanted. But he was willing to share something far more important with him. Do you know what? Many of our workplaces are lacking today. What they're lacking today is people who are honest. Honest in their dealings with people. Honest with their friends. Honest about how we speak and not living dishonest and double lives, but truthful and honest. Peter calls, he says, he says, but what I give to you is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, Peter wanted the man to know that what he was about to receive was not coming from him, but it was coming from Jesus himself. And if we want to get involved in sharing Jesus with our friends and our family, we need to realise and be willing that actually we need to be dependent upon God. He is the one who we are calling people to follow. And perhaps the next bit of this story is the hardest of all. Because it was 100% dependent upon God turning up. You know, it's sometimes at this point some of us struggle. But the reality is 
that Peter had learned something. It was God in whom he could trust. He realised that it wasn't him that could do it, but it was God who could do it. And he had faith and belief in God that day. You know, we need to realise that Jesus is the answer. You know, it does sadden me sometimes when people are disappointed with God. Perhaps when Christians have made claims about God or on God's behalf, which they're not able to deliver on. But we need to be people who are not scared to have faith in God himself. It's easy sometimes to play safe. But sometimes we need to step out and expect great things from God. One thing we can be sure of is Peter was not just acting out of presumption. Just a thought at this point, but you know, is it not possible that Jesus himself had walked past this man in the past? I mean, he'd been into the temple many times and it says that this man sat at the beautiful gate. But this was this man's day. This was this man's hour. And it was Peter and John who were to, to deliver to him the good news and for them to see a miracle that day. First of all, they had an expectation. Peter and John had an expectation that God was going to do the miraculous and he used them to do it. Greater things than these you will do, Jesus had said to them. And they were believing it. They believed it when Jesus said, you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We are to be a Pentecostal church who believe that the power of God is still available for today. The second thing is an experience. You know, experiences are vital elements. They had seen lame men walk before. I want us to fill our hearts with faith in God of what God has done in the past that God can do in our presence. You know, one thing I found about sharing our faith is often it starts with just one simple sentence. The first words are often the hardest words. It's opening our mouth, taking the opportunity to share. But God can use any one of us. So often in our Christian lives, we let our minds concentrate on the problem. I can't do it. I'm not the right type of person. But God wants to use each one of us. Peter and John were very different characters. And yet God was going to use both of them on this day to make a difference in this man's life. And then the third thing, faith. They had an anticipation that God was going to work on their behalf. They had a faith that kicked in. Peter was faced with an impossible situation. You know, I don't think this man was picked at random. I think Peter somehow knew in the depth of his conviction that this was the day, that this was the day when God was going to do a miracle in this man's life. But even when we feel this way, we still got to be willing to step out. We still got to be willing to take that prompt. He was in a very public place. The stakes were high. If Peter messed up, it would be a very embarrassing situation. But he was willing to listen and be prompted by God's Holy Spirit. And I think he was acting out of Holy Spirit prompting, not just natural presumption. Okay, so let's kind of bring this through to a close. There's a few more things that we need to see here. First of all, he worked with God's Holy Spirit and God that day did an amazing miracle in the life of this person. At this point, Peter knew he could not do it in his own strength. To keep on our phone theme, as it were, he needed operator assistance. He needed an operator to help him. And that operator was God's Holy Spirit working with him through the power of Jesus in his life. It says in verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Peter was a strong guy. He probably could have, in his natural strength, have lifted him to his feet. But it was only God 
that could do the miracle and keep him on his feet that day. It kind of reminds me of the, G the miracle that Jesus did. When the father of the boy, he said to him, he said, do you believe? And the father said, I believe. Help my unbelief. There was something that Peter needed to do that day. He needed to be willing to take the risk. He needed to be willing to reach out. But there was also something that the man needed to do. He needed to take hold of his hands. And as Peter reached out his hands, the man responded, and God did the miracle. I wonder this week, who is God prompting us to reach out a hand to? Who is God prompting us to say, look, I haven't got that, but I have got this. Let me introduce you today to Jesus. And we have the opportunity. These are difficult and strange times. And even when we begin together to meet in a church, it's not going to look like normal for quite a while yet. We've still got a lot of things to work through and difficulties to overcome as we gather together. But God is going to give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with others. I hope that together you will join with me as a church and we will look for the opportunities that God gives us to make a difference in the lives of others. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this great story. I thank you for what brings us to this story, that Peter and John have walked with Jesus. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray that today, Lord, that you would fill us afresh with the power of your Holy Spirit. But Lord God, that we would look around us for the opportunities that you give us to be good news, to be people who reach out our hands to others that have faith and an expectation in a supernatural God to do supernatural things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us today. It's been great spending this Sunday worshipping with you. Please don't hesitate to get in touch if there's anything which we can do to help you. And now we're going to close with one final worship song together. Have a great week, everybody.